This paper is, uh, uh, was written uh, the, while uh, during a, during a, a sabbat well, we began to, to think of this paper during a sabbatical uh, period I spent at Stanford University and uh, Alex was there. And it was uh, a very exciting period because uh, we were sitting together in one of uh, Tom Sargent's class and uh, you can imagine how many questions he asked Tom all the time and then he, he continued to talk with me and Willie about the issues we discussed in the class and one topic that uh, came up is, you know, what do you do of these tools, how, how can they be useful to understand something of the real world of monetary policy institutions and I had learned a lot from Alex about monetary institutions since uh, you know I first as a young student read his book on central bank independence so uh, in some sense I, I really strongly feel that this paper uh, would have not been created if Alex was not there and he wouldn't have pushed us to think about you know what to do of these tools I don't know if uh, I will convince you that this has anything to say about uh, the real world, but uh, it was fun and it was very, uh, for us, uh, instructive to, to do this exercise. And Willie, the, my co-author, who's now at Chicago University, was a, a student uh, sitting in that class. So the topic of this paper uh, uh, con concentrates on uh, interdependencies between countries that may give rise as is well known, uh, to uh, inefficient uh, decentralized decisions, uh, like inefficient Nash equilibrium. And this uh, <coughs> intuition has, uh, sometimes, is sometimes proposed in the monetary policy uh, field to justify, to explain, to provide an explanation for why countries may want to uh, adopt an arrangement which is uh, in some sense inefficient that imagine you have two countries and each has its own independent policy instrument and they may want to join because of this inefficiency that they have when they independently set the policy instrument it may be welfare improving for them just to kill one of the two instruments adopt a single one which obviously solves the coordination problem but presumably at the expense of losing some flexibility now you can rig up simple games in which you can show that for you know, some parameters value, this choice could be well for improving. So, <clears throat> an argument for a monetary union that uh, sometimes, you know, you tell the students is that if you have some inefficiency under a non-cooperative Nash uh, kind of game, uh, uh, these countries might choose to somehow destroy one of the two instruments and commit to, you know, to, to, to stay in a new institutional setting where uh, they have a single policy instrument which uh, eliminates the coordination problem. Now, I think it's interesting, uh, uh, here I will refer to monetary union, but other arrangements have uh, similar uh, features. Uh, several international monetary arrangements puts a lot of constraints on the flexibility that independent, that countries can use independently. and. And there are historic examples of that. The EMU is probably the one the most well known now, or I may be biased in that respect, but monetary unions are being discussed in several countries all around the world. So why did what what do we do here? Um, we try to deal with two limitations of the story of the simple story that I tell the students, like compare a Nash equilibrium with something else. Now the current, so what I call this, uh, this, the current theory of MUs has a very simplified dynamics in the following sense that the analysis that uh, uh, we can find in the literature kind of compare one static Nash equilibrium to this arrangement where you only have one instrument. And now, we think that if you want to make a robot, you know, a counter argument to this rationale for a monetary union could be, well, you know, countries can do better than Nash. If it's a repeated game, they, with, by means of some reputation, they could sustain maybe first best, maybe. So, so this is not really a strong rationale. What, you know, what happens of your monetary union rationale if you let the agents the possibility to sustain a reputational equilibrium? So we want to try to study the monetary union by giving the countries in the game the possibility to play. You know, we want to compare. We don't want to put a restriction on the 
<laughs> strategies that the agents play. We will have infinite horizon and the agents will be allowed to play uh, the best reput sustainable reputational equilibrium. The second limitation that we try to deal with in this paper concerns the following point, that uh, some of these, ana these analyses that I told you about kind of compare from the perspective of a constitutional stage, or call it time zero, what's the expected welfare under uh, Nash, what is the expected ne uh, welfare under uh, playing uh, like a game in which uh, you constrain the countries to have just one instrument, and that's it. If, if the second arrangement is superior to the first one, you assume that they get in, and that they have no further choices afterwards. But, so you know, you know in some sense you assume that the both arrangements are enforceable by some technology or something. That the cost of leaving the union once you are in is, uh, is infinite. Now this is the assumption, by the way, that, that you know, would allow you to, to write down the two problems like, a, a, well, if you don't have exogenous dynamics, you could write the two problems like infinite horizons problem, but then because of this assumption, they break out, in, they break up and, and reduce to static problems. But it could well happen that, you know, ex ante, you think the monetary union is a great idea, <clears throat> like it happens in many uh, problems of this kind, you know, many unions problem, marriages, co-authorship relationship, ex ante, they look great, then you get in, and you may end up in some state in which it doesn't look that great anymore. So you want to leave. So we want to analyze this, you know, how you can sustain it once you get in. And the, the quote from uh, Thorsten and Guido, is a good way to put it. You know, they say uh, that individual countries may have incentives to deviate from the cooperative policy. And the argument, I guess, uh, you know, the argument for such agreements is incomplete unless you, you, you have some argument about how you can enforce such a cooperative solution. And so we, this is like, we will look at this problem by um, taking into account the participation constraint that countries in each period have to be willing to, to remain in the union. Uh, okay, so the outline is, uh, I will uh, give some uh, uh, a picture of what's the economic environment that uh, we, we tell our story in. Uh, the two policy regimes that we consider, I will give definitions of what I mean by, you know, what countries can do without the monetary union, the independent national monetary policy regime, and what is the monetary union in our uh, paper. Then I'll spend some time characterizing what is optimal policy in this monetary union. How does it look like? It has, I think, some nice features that uh, it cannot be derived under the setup with uh, exogenous enforcement or, or the static problem. Uh, then, uh, if I have time, I hope, I will uh, give you, I will show you some uh, <coughs> results by using a, a simple uh, example economy, a quadra linear quadratic that uh, allows us to derive some of the results analytically and conclude. <clears throat> so what's the economic environment? We considered two countries, call them home and foreign, no much fantasy, infinite horizon and discrete time. <clears throat> and there are S states of the world that these countries uh, may be in with probability, each state's probability PS. Now an important object in this problem, since it is a, like a reputational infinite horizon problem, it, it's the history. So the history is this object HT, which contains all realization of past policies by home and foreign, and uh, the history of the states S. And strategy pairs are, um, are, are uh, sequences of, of pies. Uh, pi is the policy instrument in home, and pi star is the policy instrument abroad, and this uh, choice may depend, you know, in principle on the whole history H of T. So what do countries do? They maximize a utility function, a present value uh, discounted utility, uh, where um, the utility function U has three arguments. It depends on pi, your policy choice. It depends on pi star, the policy choice of the other country, and it depends on S. Uh, the last argument is a shortcut for making the utility state dependent, sort of what uh, Francisco was using yesterday. We will be very, we will not really go into any economics. So uh, the last argument serves to describe, you know, how, well, uh, you, I'll get to that in example. And the two, the pi and the pi star, uh, naturally are used to generate some spillovers between the choices of the two countries. So two policy regimes. One is, you know, take this setup and just uh, 
uh, get a utility function of some form and compute what are uh, the subgame perfect equilibria that you can sustain with reputation. <clears throat> uh, and what is the monetary union? Now this is key, this is our assumption. We assume the monetary union is two things. First, it requires the two countries who join to choose the same value for the policy instrument pi. And uh, because of the participation constraint though, we assume that at each point in time a country can decide to leave the union and reinstall its money print. So you can think of the pies like, you know, you print money, the other guy prints money. One way to constrain, monetary union is a technology. We decide, okay, uh, Guido and I form a monetary union, so we destroy one of the two machines. Why do we destroy it? Because so both of us are sure that nobody can deviate. I mean, it's some metaphor to describe it, that there is a technology. We set up a big building in Frankfurt. Everybody knows about it. People go there. So if I want to get out of the monetary union, I can, but our crucial assumption here is that it takes some time and it does not come as a surprise to the other agent. So the key difference between like a deviation under uh, independent national monetary policy and the monetary union is that under independent national monetary policy, I may tell Guido, yeah, yeah, sure, I will not uh, you know, make any inflation surprises, but then I go home and print more money and he cannot prevent it. I have my own machine. With the monetary union, we assume you cannot do it. You can decide, sorry, I, I thought it was a good marriage, but uh, I don't think like that anymore, but he knows. So I, there's no unexpected deviation from the plan. So <clears throat> this is uh, standard part, uh, subgame perfect equilibria, are sequences of, of choices for pi that satisfy the following uh, constraint. So the utility, say the first one uh, for home, or the utility that home obtains under a given policy plan pi, um, plus the continuation, these, these w's are, you know, uh, f future uh, expected values uh, derived from this policy must be greater than what? On the right-hand side term, pi superscript d indicates a deviation. So it must be better to, to stick to this policy plan rather than uh, for home to deviate unexpectedly when, pi, when the foreign guy is playing pi star. And the uh, subgame perfect things tells us that if you deviate, then you will get the W lower bar, right? I mean, these are all endogenous objects, but there is a way, like you can use a Pearson Stachetti to compute what these objects are. The W lower bar is itself a subgame perfect equilibria, the one that yields the lowest utility level. So it's a punishment, right? It's a stick and carrot uh, kind of idea. So you want to look for plans and their subgame uh, perfect uh, equilibria that satisfy this, this constraint. And, uh, and the set of values, so when you solve uh, such a problem, you, you, you can characterize the solution by the set of values you know, that are produced for each of the countries by the sustainable plan. And objects that we will look at are like living this space, imagine, um, so the Ws uh, and W star welfare, expected welfare for home and foreign, you know, you consider all of the possible, given a utility function, discount, et cetera, you, you produce the, the, the set of values that can be sustained by uh, policy plans that satisfy those two constraints. And then within that set, Nash will probably be some point in the middle. Reputation can allow you to do much better than Nash. The, the red frontier, the red frontier is actually the Pareto frontier, the efficient. And there is something, the W in the bottom, which is the worst. You can also do much much worse than, than Nash. Uh, this is uh, actually the, the same frontier from a computation, uh, you know. So you see that actually Nash here is some, something like minus 0.4, minus 0.4, so it's right in the middle. And this example shows that you can do much worse and much better than Nash. And actually, as you know, it's the worst that allows you to sustain uh, the very best outcomes because you sustain the best by threatening uh, to, to revert to wars, to very bad uh, policies. That's the way these uh, games work. So this is the standard part. <clears throat> so uh, the monetary union, as I said, it requires the two countries to implement the same policy, so the same value of pi. Uh, now, how do we describe actions here? Uh, countries observe the state, S, and the whole history. And they make simultaneous announcement. You can, you can think of it as votes, which we call A. 
on whether they want to follow the prescribed policy or not. Zero means I want to follow the prescribed policy. One means I don't want to follow the prescribed policy. What is the prescribed policy? I'll, I'll be talking about an equilibrium. So we'll have um, like an algorithm that in each period tells us this equilibrium says in this period you have to choose to go for this policy. Do you, want, do you like it or not? Do you vote for it or not? Now I'll be more precise about it. Key assumption, we assume that if countries don't uh, agree, so they don't vote unanimous, unanimously for the, common, for the policy suggested by uh, you know, the plan, they can break the union and revert to some equilibria of the game we just saw, the um, INMP game, independent monetary policy. So they can leave the union and go play some you know, I'll uh, it will be an endogenous object, which one they want to play. So uh, it's a little bit, at least to me, complicated how, how, you, how the setup that we ended up using to describe how, uh, you know, to make this recursive. And in the beginning, the paper was simpler, but the referees uh, the, actually it was very good to, to, we were assuming the following. We were assuming countries could do the same, you know, could do a common policy in the union, and then we were assuming if they don't agree, you know, one of the two countries is better off leaving, they go and play Nash, the static Nash. This was clearly a doc. Why Nash? Why is it a doc? Because we discovered by, by going deeper into the analysis that uh, this policy was not efficient. You could actually think of it, think of it this way. It's clear that by constraining yourself to use the common policy, you may find yourself in some states in which it is very inefficient to adopt a common policy. Some state, in some states, it may actually be efficient for both of us to decide, well, uh, we have to, it's in, it's in both of us interests that, you know, we, we, we the union. So in those cases, you revert to something like, which is outside the, to the, the independent monetary policy game. In those states, you want to go to a good equilibrium. Why, why, you know, why do damage to yourself? These are like what we will call the unequilibrium breakups. Our problem will have some uh, states and certain histories which prescribe that the monetary union has to break. It does not always happen, but some setups have this, that with probability one, the monetary union will break. And those unequilibrium breakups, which are efficient for both countries, will be rewarded by a reversion to a good INMP equilibrium. Why, why hurt yourself? But on the other hand, uh, we want to be able to differentiate those breakups which are off equilibrium. So suppose that the plan tells us you should uh, play the common monetary policy, but one of the two guys me, it's particularly nice to say, no, no, I want to deviate. Then the rule, the contract of, for this monetary union specifies that we are going to play a bad equilibrium so that, you know, I do not have incentives to, to, to actually do it. So why, so these three functions that describe what a policy plan, a policy plan is something simple. It's just a, a long sequences, a long sequence of, of pie choices that depend on histories. But in order to describe that for the monetary union, we use three functions. That's the best we, do, we could come up with. So it's, it's a for, the second function tells us, you know, given history HT, that belongs to this big set of all possible history, play the common policy pi t, which is in that closed interval. Uh, the first function tells us whether uh, the, the, the plan, this given plan, <coughs> so, this three function, I should have said that, actually define what a plan is. So this long sequence of, of pi's is a function of the function d, is determined by the function d, by the function uh, pi, bad notation, and the function beta. So you give me, you know, you put in my computer these three functions, then you give me a history, and I will know what policy to play. d tells me whether the plan, one possible plan prescribes that we play common policy or not. If it's zero, it says common policy. If it's one, it says you should revert to INMP. Pi prescribes what policy we play, what common policy we play, provided that, you know, delta is uh, zero, so we play common policy. And beta 
is which equilibria we play if we break. Now, why did I tell you the story about the Nash you know, in the previous version of the paper? Because in the previous version of the paper, this was simple. You know, if we break, we play Nash. But I told you this was inefficient because beta is a function of the history, the D, and the voter's announcement. Why? I need this function to discriminate between on equilibrium and off equilibrium breakups. So if delta is zero, that means the union has to be kept together. And both, and one of the two alpha instead is one. One guy wants to deviate. Even when the plan prescribes that no deviations have to occur, then the beta function will punish the guy. Instead, when, del when D prescribes a breakup, then, you know, then the beta function will know that, well, the guys are breaking up, but actually it was written in our, in our equilibrium book that in this, after this history we had to break up. So in that case, no punishment occurs. So what is, you know, then there, there is, this is a set, uh, a lot of, uh, the, the, the big set, uh, and under this set we want to pick some of these sequences that have certain uh, desirable properties. So sustainable policy plans are triplets of functions that, uh, um, that are always uh, approved uh, of by the agents. So the A's are always zero. So the first uh, item tells us that for every history which recommends, you know, keep the union together, both countries will actually vote to keep the union together and, and go for the common policy. And for every history which prescribes to break the union, then for both countries it must actually be uh, the best choice to, to obey the rule and go and, pray and play whatever uh, subgame perfect equilibrium is prescribed by B, by beta. So as, as in the previous case, there are, there are two participation constraints uh, that tells us exactly what I just said in words. Uh, and you know, there is a set of sustainable policy plans, and inside this set you can trace out an efficient frontier. Uh, and uh, OK, so there is one result which is pretty intuitive. That's a characterization of the beta function. The, all, all this says is that you know, it's a fi if, if uh, the breakup is prescribed by the rule, then the equilibrium you revert to will be on the frontier, right? It would be inefficient if, given that you break and it's in both countries' interests, then you're going to play something efficient on the frontier. We cannot yet here pinpoint exactly to which point on the frontier you go, but we know, you know, the proof is rather simple. These are the two welfare levels for the two countries. Given that you break, imagine this is a long an equilibrium. Suppose that at some point it's efficient to break, then why go here? You can increase the value of the game by just, you know, putting, adding something that's on top, that's on the frontier. And then the second part tells us that instead, if somebody wants to deviate, you, pr you punish deviations by using the worst possible outcomes. That's again the usual. You have these participation constraints for the union that tell you that today's utility plus continuation values uh, uh, have to be greater than some policies that, that are prescribed if breakup occurs. Now, to sustain good values here, you better have very, you know, you, you sustain bigger values of, of this object by, by threatening to, to have low betas if one deviates. I mean, you, you enlarge the space of sustainable plants by lowering the betas. You make the constraint less, uh, less stringent. So you can, there is a part of the paper that shows that you can give a recursive formulation for this problem. It's, it's OK. And now, to characterize what an equilibrium, equilibrium policies, the pies, will look like in this economy, it's, um, it's relatively, it's best done by looking at the Lagrangian formulation of this problem. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to take. So if you take this Lagrangian and take first order condition with respect to these little v's are like the promised values, the value that one country, home, and foreign ha, ha, uh, receives from adhering to the policy in the monetary union. So this, this equation is basically giving us you know, the efficient frontier. This is only, I'm just looking now at the efficient frontier portion. 
and it's telling me <coughs> the following you give foreign a certain utility expected utility this much you know this this tells me how what's the utility that home can obtain given that foreign has this utility level subject to a, a number of constraints that's the usual promise giving that you're actually going to deliver this utility to that guy and the two participation constraints so <coughs> In each period, you enter a, the problem with, the, with a certain, uh, the way we look at it is with the planner problem. You, you, you enter the problem with a certain level of utility that was promised to the other guy. And then you ask, you know, given that I entered the problem with this V0, I had promised Guido that he would get a utility level of at least, say, V0, then what happens in each state, you know, uh, in each state, I have to choose a certain level of pi, the, the, the common policy. And I have to choose a vector of Vs, which are the promises that I will make Guido for next period's plays, depending on which state we end up to. Okay, so if you take first of the conditions with respect now first to, to this object, you get, you get a, an expression from this Lagrange that's like this. So the mu s and the, and the theta s are the Lagrange multipliers of the two participation constraints. And note that from the envelope condition, if you take a derivative of this object with respect to, to v0, you get that uh, uh, the slope, this is the usual, the slope of the value function at uh, v0 is equal to uh, the value of the Lagrange multiplier of, you know, the of the V0, right? I mean, the more utility you want to give to this guy, the less this is going to be positive, the less uh, utility you're going to get. So this has a negative slope. Now, it's relatively easy from this uh, thing to characterize what policy looks like. When the two participation constraints do not bind, so suppose you have arrived at a stage where nobody, none of the two countries actually has incentive to leave the union, so this theta, theta s and mu s are equal to zero, then this thing implies that the V prime of Vs, the utility I want to promise the foreign guy in this state, is equal to lambda, a lot of stuff simplifies, and lambda is equal to this, so it's equal to V prime of V0. So the promise I entered with the period is unchanged in all, st in all states where participation constraints don't bind. That's very intuitive. So we entered with a given promise, we uh, see the shocks, uh, none of the countries incentive to leave, we go on to, more, to, to, to tomorrow with the same kind of setup that we have entered uh, the, the, the agreement with. But now the interesting case instead is, is when one of the two constraints is binding. So foreign constraint uh, has this Lagrange multiplier mu. Now if you do a little bit of algebra, you see that, uh, <clears throat> that when mu is not zero, so it's positive, then that first order conditions implies that you're going to give that guy a greater promise utility for the future. So the way you keep him in the union when the participation constraint is binding is by promising him uh, that uh, tomorrow he will have a little more weight in, in common decisions. And also because there is a smoothing from the first order conditions on the pies, you could see that you also give that guy a little bit more uh, of utility in this period. So you smooth uh, rewards intertemporally, but the, I think the nice thing is that uh, this, so think of it, you know, if you assume that, if you uh, assume the way the participation constraints, you could look at such a problem like a, a standard Pareto problem where you maximize the utility of two agents with some Pareto weights Q, okay? And now if you take Q like we usually do in Pareto problems as, as a given, you know, then, then you get policies and, and promise values depending on the queues. Now here what we get is like the queue is changing. When the participation constraint binds, it's like, it's, it is as if you go back to stage zero and say, well, solve this problem again, but give a queue that's a little better for you because you wants to live. So give him a little more weight. These are actually, this can be rephrased in terms of Pareto weights. 
So summarizing, this gives us some interesting dynamics because it's like the policy rule, you enter the period with some given weights in policy decisions, then if, uh, if no countries have incentives to leave, then you know the future uh, is like uh, today. But when one country has an incentive to leave, he has some negotiating uh, bargaining power and, and his uh, weight in policy decision is increased. Change the Pareto weight and then move on like this. Now there's a section now, I, uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes. I won't have time to go into the sustainability, but uh, I, I would like, I prefer to speak about the example economy. So we consider, just to you know, show some, uh, that, that this uh, thing can be applied, um, we consider a simple economy where the utility of one country is, depends on, uh, on the shock epsilon. So you can think of epsilon like a desired level of the exchange rate or inflation or something. So one country wants to have its policy instrument as close as possible to epsilon. At the same time, he would like to have his pi, uh, well, this is utility, so pi greater than the pi star of the other country. This is obviously a doc, but it's just, a, and that's to create the spillover, right? So the alpha parameter tells us how big the spillover thing is. Uh, okay, so we can show in this setup, uh, well, first of all, if you solve the Pareto problem in this setup, you would get that, uh, uh, a, an optimal pi under a monetary union with enforcement that is the one that you enter and then you're never allowed to leave is, it looks, it looks uh, something like this. It's, uh, it's Q of uh, the show. So it's a weighted average with weights Q of, uh, of the two desired uh, levels of the policy instrument desired by, by each of these countries. Now what happens here is that these cues, as I, as I showed you, but here we can show it analytically, these cues uh, are time varying and depend you know, on, on whether the participation constraints bind. And you can show intuitively that when, you know, when home's participation constraint bind, then cues, uh, the cue that refers to home's utility actually increases and, and so on. And then the paper, has some computation where we show that, for instance, you can, uh, you know, we go back to the original point. Can, can you rationalize a monetary union uh, in, uh, uh, that, that is better, that yields superior outcomes to, that yields better out outcomes than, uh, than a static Nash, than, uh, than the best uh, reputational equilibrium? This table shows that if, you know, as, as is intuitive, if the externality is sufficiently big, uh, that's the second line. So the first line, you know, when the externality is small, the best uh, symmetric uh, sustainable uh, equilibrium is uh, minus 0.05, and the best uh, monetary union is pretty bad compared to that. So you would go for independent monetary policies. But as the externality grows a little bit, then the best sustainable symmetric equilibrium minus 0.7 is worse than you can get with, uh, uh, with the monetary union. And the, the, the second column is monetary union, assuming that uh, you can enforce it. And the third column is monetary union, assuming that there's no enforcement. Now, at first, when we saw this line, we, say, we thought, well, so this monetary union without enforcement, clearly, we thought, is going to do, <clears throat> because in some states, you know, you have to compromise, you have to readjust policy, so there's no perfect smoothing is not going to do as well as the monetary union with enforcement. But that, that's not always true. Because the monetary union with enforcement is particularly bad in states where uh, policies can get very, uh, shocks can be very asymmetric and you cannot break. So the second, uh, the second picture shows that a voluntary monetary union, the, the one that may allow you to live, can actually be superior to a monetary union with enforcement if shocks are sufficiently uh, asymmetric. Uh, I'm sorry, I, perhaps I didn't, so the computation, you know, the, there was this S shock in the utility function and we assume, you see that we, we assume for states, it can be one, zero, zero, one. This is a small asymmetric shock or it can be for our parametrization, a big shock, which is 3003. And this 3003, when it happens, you cannot sustain the monetary union. So this would be a contract for the monetary union that says, 
until you stay in the 0110 kind of state, you are together with this common policy, but when you end up in this, which can be a very low probability event, but you know, it's there, so at some point you will end up there, then you better break and go to INMP. Now, of course, you know, one obvious question would be, well, but what, you know, countries break and then could they form, could they form a new monetary union? Here, uh, for us, it was already quite complicated and we decided to, to follow the assumption that, you know, once you break, you break forever. Uh, if you allow countries to form a new union in this setup, they will always, like, you know, after one period, they would like to, to go back into it because you form it for free. So to make it a little bit more interesting, then it, it would be natural, I think, and, and reasonable to assume that, yes, you can form a new union, but forming a union has some fixed costs, you know, in terms of, uh, I don't know, uh, even political cost of, you know, having to justify with your public why you're continuously, you know, leaving unions, forming unions, or, or setting up institutions and stuff. So, so if you put some fixed costs, it would not be so trivial that you break and you want to get in immediately. So summarizing, uh, we show with, um, that optimal policy in a voluntary monetary union by responding to the country's incentives to, to stay or leave uh, takes uh, interesting you know, uh, time, time dynamics, temporal dynamics that you cannot see from the, from the standard uh, static framework and that there are both temporary, you know, with these fluctuations of, of, of of power, temporary unions and, and permanent ones. The temporary ones are those that occur when you have sufficiently asymmetric shocks. They stay up for some time, but then at some point they break. And one point that we make is that these breaks are not necessarily inefficient. It may be good, exante, to think I'm going to be with that guy for some time, but then, as sometimes happens, you know, you decide afterwards, this is time that we live. So, uh, we have developed this framework. We think it may have other applications uh, to, you know, problems like political coalitions and setups where uh, different agents have somehow to coordinate on a single common action. Think of uh, two political parties who have to f who f decide to form a coalition and then have to agree on a common program. They cannot independently, uh, you know, present their own uh, program. And and you have, I think, uh, other uh, examples like this. And my co-author suggested co-authoring relationships and since uh, we're not planning to write another paper, I'm afraid <laughs> we, are, we were on a breakup path. <laughs> I'm finished.